This mini PC uses a brand new processor with a new memory. It has spots for multiple SSDs inside while still remaining very small. There are two 2.5 two gig Ethernet ports, there's Thunderbolt, USB 4, and it's from a vendor that you've probably heard of before. I think we have a lot to get to today, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this is the ASRock Industrial Nookbox 255H. Now, you might say, Patrick, haven't I seen this before? And uh, well, there's a good reason for that. Uh, about a year ago, we reviewed the Nookbox 155H, that one difference is, uh, you know, not a whole lot when you're looking at the chassis, right? And although they look similar, these have massive changes because we've gone from Meteor Lake to Arrow Lake. One of the biggest changes by far is that we no longer have hyper threading, but on the other hand, Intel somehow manages to get more performance without hyper threading. We also use a new type of memory, which is called a CSO DIMM, which means that we have even higher clock speed on our memory as well, which gives us a little bit more performance. So this is more of a performance upgrade rather than a completely new like paradigm shift. And maybe that's why these look the same. Now, real quick, I want to point out that ASRock Industrial sent us this bare bones unit. On the other hand, we had to go put memory and we had to put SSD in here and all that kind of stuff. So I do want to say thank you to our STH YouTube members who support this channel and allow us to buy components so we can put them in these systems. Because we have so many folks supporting us, I have to say that this is sponsored. If you do want to help us out, you can always do that down below. Now, we do want to get something out of the way real quick, which is some folks noticed in our last video that uh, during part of the video, there was a much larger version of me. And at the end of the video, there was a much smaller version of me. The reason for that is that I have been on a massive diet just to get kind of healthier uh, since probably about October, November last year and uh, started to pay dividends. So you might see that I'm a lot smaller and that's what's going on. It's been hard to record videos since I've been at a huge calorie deficit, but on the other hand, I just needed to get lighter so I could get healthier. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so looking at the system itself, this is pretty darn small. It's very much a nook form factor, which a lot of people call like, you know, four by four or whatever, but really it's, I think like a 4.63 by 4.33 inches. And then uh, it's about just under two inches, so about 1.93 inches tall. Now looking at the front of the system, we get a combo headset jack, always useful. We also get a USB three gen two. So it's a 10 gigabit port. And this is just nice to have a type A port on the front. The next two ports are both USB type C ports. Well, kind of, and it's also also really annoying and one of my biggest pet peeves with the system because the first port over here, that is a Thunderbolt 4 and a USB 4 port. So you get a lot of high speed IO out of that little type C port. The one next to it is not. It's a USB three two by two ports, so a 20 gigabit per second port. Both of these do support display output. So you can get, use these as your first two display outputs if you want. But even those specs are a little bit different because the Thunderbolt 4 and USB 4 port that supports DisplayPort 2.1. If we were to go to the other USB type C port, which is our two by two port, that supports DisplayPort 1.4A. So at this point, I think you know my biggest pet peeve, which is I really appreciate the fact that there are some labels on the front of this chassis. On the other hand, I would like to know which one is my Thunderbolt port and which one is my USB port, but they're just labeled with this like little label on the bottom that looks like they're the same. Sure, they both do support USB and DisplayPort, but they're kind of widely different in what they support. And you don't have any indication that this supports Thunderbolt 4. So I wish that ASRock Industrial took the lead from someone like Adele or something where they actually go and label ports with great specificity so you know what the heck a port does. Ports in 2025 should be labeled. Call me old fashioned or maybe new fashioned. Completing the front, there's a power button. On both sides, we have vents, not too exciting. On the top, we have just the plastic top. On the bottom, we have our little rubber feet. We'll get to those in a second. And then on the back, we get kind of the big features here. Now, the first feature that we get on top here is that we get a massive, relatively massive fan vent. You can see the copper heatsink fins in there and then also the Kensington lock port. There's our DC power input jack. We'll show you the power brick, but unlike a Mac mini, the power brick is still external here and it's actually pretty large. The rear USB ports are USB three gen two, so 10 gigabit per second USB type A ports there. And then we get two HDMI ports. Now these are HDMI 2.1 TMDS ports. 
Now the two last set of ports here, these are two two and a half gig ethernet ports and they're not just some kind of cheapo real technics. Instead, we have Intel i226. Now one is an i226V, the other one is an i226LM. That LM is important because although both of them will operate at two and a half gig ethernet and functionally there's not a huge difference between them. The one big difference with the LM is, well, one, it's I think a slightly different driver, some like a little bit different support on it. But the other difference and the big one is the fact that it supports vPro. It's definitely nowhere near as good as something like IPMI, but on the other hand, it's better to have vPro than not have vPro if you do want to have that remote manageability. Now, I do want to put the disclaimer out there that a lot of folks are going to say, hey, wait, I don't want to have any kind of management, extra management surface, whether it's IPMI, whether that's vPro, any of those types of things in my system because that's just another security surface. So I don't want V Pro, and if that's the case, then you know you have to disable it at least. But for most folks buying something like this, they're gonna want to have that remote manageability, and that's what V Pro provides. So I guess the two things that it would be nice to see would be an internal power supply at some point. I know there are folks that like external power supplies because they're easy to swap. Fair enough. But the other thing I would like to see would be more USB ports. You have three Type A ports and two Type C ports, which is five total. If you have the Type C ports on the front connected to monitors, and you don't have a way to get USB out of that, well then you just have three Type A ports. Okay, now I talked really briefly about the bottom and the rubber feet. Now this does have like a Visa mounting bracket, so you wanna go put it on the back of a monitor or something like that, you could do that. But the little rubber feet back here have our screws and by undoing the screws, we can get inside the system, which we're gonna do next. Okay, so getting inside the system, super easy. You have these long screws that sit inside the rubber feet, makes it a nice clean solution. Of course, I do prefer when you have toolless chassis just because it makes life a little bit easier. And I almost stripped one of these screws totally and didn't get this thing open. Okay, now once we're inside this, there are some things going on well beyond this just being a you know piece of metal that's not too exciting. Instead, there's a whole bunch of thermal pads here. We have uh, you know the protective cover still on one of them because we're not using it, but the other ones definitely are there and they're useful. So what these are, and you can see there's like a little tiny heat sink here. This is to go and conduct heat from the hot components that are on the bottom of the chassis and at least give them a little bit of extra heat sink surface area. Now to get three SSDs in a system this small, you gotta do a couple things. Like first off, you have a SATA SSD that goes into the lid. So there's a little space here that you can kind of see where you put your SSD in there, you screw it in and that's how you get your SSD in. And then you have this little cable. This cable connects to the motherboard connector. And if you put this all together, you have a SSD, which is a SATA SSD. You can use it for boot or whatever the heck you want. Okay, now looking at the main part of the system, this is a design that looks almost identical to previous generations of the Nookbox series, right? So what you have is you have your two SO DIMM slots, then you have a M.2 2242. So if you have a smaller SSD, you could put that there. Then on top, you have a M.2 2280 SSD. And in that 2280 slot, we have our 80 millimeter SK Hynix P41 Platinum drive, and that gives us a two terabyte drive, which is always nice to have. Now, of course, if you do want to do something like have RAID or something in this, then what you would do is most likely want like probably a one or two terabyte drive only, not go up to like four or larger drive, because you're gonna have to have the M.2 2242, so a smaller drive also be the same capacity. It is kind of a bummer that we don't have two 2280 slots because that just is kind of weird to have two different SSDs in the same system, instead of being able to standardize on one of them. Now, under the 80 millimeter slot, we have a Wi-Fi card slot. Now this is already populated in our system with an Intel AX211, which is a Wi-Fi 6E solution. I think it has Bluetooth, 5.3 as well. And so you get something that's a fairly modern solution. Personally, I would have really liked to see the BE200 or at least the, some kind of Wi-Fi 7 solution. I get it though, a lot of folks don't have Wi-Fi 7 yet, so why go and uh, put a Wi-Fi 7 NIC in this that costs more, I get it. Now getting to the memory, I wanna point out that these are not your standard SO DIMMs like we had in previous generations. Now, of course, you know there are a bunch of options that you can put in here, but what we're showing here is actually crucial CSO DIMMs. So you'll see that these are DDR5 60 400 CSO DIMMs. And the easy way to tell that they are is that you can see underneath the label on the front side where all the chips are, there's this little rectangle and that's a montage clock driver. In some ways, it's like part of the functionality that you get in like a DDR5 uh, RDIM, like for servers, 
but it's not that whole functionality by far. But having that clock driver on the device allows us to run at higher memory speeds, and that's what allows us to get our DDR5 6400 memory here. But of course, because Crucial, Micron, and others have to go and put an extra component on their SO DIMMs, that means that, you know, they cost a little bit more. So it's kind of like any new memory technology. It's not as big as like when we go went from like DDR4 to DDR5 or anything like that. But on the other hand, there is another component. So you're going to see a little bit more cost on these DIMMs to go a little bit faster. Now that DDR5 6400 support is something new with our new Arrow Lake processor. So when we get to code names, the previous Nuckbox 155H, that one used the Meteor Lake 155H processor. This one uses the Intel Core Ultra 7255H. In terms of IGP-wise, we get the Intel Arc 140T, if you want to go look that up. Um, but it isn't like a huge difference, I don't think, on the GPU side or the IGPU side. I, to me, at least, the biggest difference with the new processor is really just, well, frankly, the fact that there's no hyper-threading. I mean, that's by far the biggest difference, right? Instead of having hyper-threading where you have two threads per core, which meant in the 155H, we had a 16-core processor that had 22 threads, the new 255H only has 16 cores and 16 threads. Now, I think a lot of folks are gonna look at Meteor Lake immediately and say like, oh man, I remember like, you know, the gaming folks were not happy with the new Meteor Lake processors because, you know, they, they just weren't like a huge jump like they were expecting and sometimes they weren't as good and all kinds of, okay, so like, let's take a step back, right? This is a mini PC. This is not like a high-end gaming rig. And there's a little difference in terms of what you want in something like this. And frankly, the differences that you would want in something that's small like this, like you might want it to be lower power Power, quiet, but still perform decently well, you may be willing to trade off some gaming performance because you're probably not playing a huge number of games on this, right? And so just before we get to our performance, then we'll talk about power, and then that kind of gives you your efficiency numbers. Let me just kind of take a step back and let's go look at the topology of this system versus the 155H. Now, of course, you're going to notice that we do have a one terabyte drive in the old one versus two terabyte drive. And it was literally just that these were on sale. So that's why we have two terabytes on this one. But the other thing that I want to just point out real quick is that you can see that in some of the first cores, the P cores, you can see that on the 155H that there are two execution units. And that's really that hyper threading or SMT. With the newer Arrow Lake version, we only get one execution unit, which is why we get our 16 cores and 16 threads. Now on this, you're gonna notice that there are a bunch of different blocks actually, because we have our performance cores and there's six of those. And then we get our eight efficient cores and these are quite a bit faster than the previous gen. And then the other thing that you'll notice is that we still have our two low power island ones. It does seem like Intel has been moving, especially on the client side, towards something that's kind of more of like an Apple model, right? Okay, now in terms of performance, this thing is definitely a good step from the previous generation. And that part of that is just because we're in a similar power envelope. And so something that we did was we just ran the two NUC boxes side by side out of the box, just, you know, default settings and just saw, you know, what would be the difference between the 155H and the 255H. And often it was maybe 15 to 25% faster than the previous gen. So that's actually a really good generational gain. We don't really do gaming benchmarks, but because this is an iGPU that's pretty prevalent, you can look for the Intel Arc 140T graphics, and that'll get you the performance range for a solution like this, where that's just the iGPU here. Now, from a performance perspective, we have seen generations of mini PCs where you're getting maybe 5 to 10, 12% generational improvement. So seeing 15 to 25% is really good. Now, of course, it's going to vary based on different applications and there's plenty of data out there on these. Still, I want to get over to the power consumption because I think that's a big part of the story. Now we have the Nookbox 255H behind me and it's actually running here and Frankly, I can't hear it from this distance. So let's talk a little bit about the power consumption, but also the noise, because I think that's something that Azeroth Industrial did a really good job of with this system. So first off, when we talk about idle power consumption, we see somewhere on the package, somewhere in that five and a half to six and change watt range. We also see at the wall that we're probably somewhere in that like maybe six to nine watt range. It jumps around a little bit and that's just kind of what it is. Okay, so now let's take the system and let's put it under some load and see what happens. So we're going to go here, we're going to hit stress, and you're going to immediately see that all of our threads, all 16 cores, 16 threads are now loaded. Now, this is where things get a little bit different because you're going to see that over the course of about a minute or two, that our overall power consumption at the 
package level is gonna hit somewhere in the 52 watts. And this ASRock industrial system out of the box will let the package just go and it has really no problem with that. Now at the wall, that translates to something around 64 to maybe 69 watts. It doesn't really hit 70 watts, so it's sitting in that range. But when we talk about the noise, I can now hear this system and we're getting somewhere in that 39-ish dBA range in a 34 dBA noise floor studio. Now there's another change that you're gonna see and it happens somewhere in that one minute or so range. You're gonna see that the system actually lets the cores run all the way up into that 90 degree Celsius range. So this is different than we saw in the 155H where we saw a really quick spike up in overall power and you know clock speeds, but then you saw a very quick pop down to that 28 watt TDP or 28 watt package power limit. Instead, you can see that even after over a minute, we're over 51, 52 watts at the package. We are definitely, you know, we have some hot cores here, but this is a very big difference between the two systems, right? I will say that in the BIOS, there are options. So you can tune the overall power limits and all that kind of stuff. So you can tune the system, but out of the box, that is a very big difference between the two. Now in the Meteor Lake video that we did last year, I did a whole AI demo with like cameras and stuff like that. I'm just not gonna do it this time because we didn't get great feedback. Like people actually wanted to see my face with bounding boxes. But I will mention that this does have not only the CPU cores, but also the iGPU and it also has an NPU. Now there's 96 tops of in eight total, but I think like only not, like 13 or so of that actually comes from the NPU. A big portion, like over 70 tops comes from the GPU. And the reason I'm pointing out that is just because I want to show you what happens to these cores and the clock speeds, which is also another big difference between this generation and the previous generation. So you're going to see that we're still sitting in that four-ish gigahertz range on our P cores. But then when we get to our E cores, we're down into that 3.5 to 3.6 gigahertz range, which by the way, is faster than you would have seen on the previous generation Meteor Lake. And then of course, our low power island cores are now at 1.3 gigahertz, which is not fast. So when we say 16 cores, remember like two of them are going very very slowly but these e cores that is a massive difference it's also a difference in the architecture on the p cores that you know we're getting something that's a fairly different processor even though the box looks very similar so overall when we ran this system on longer benchmarks i mean benchmarks that run for you know hours instead of a couple seconds or a couple minutes we certainly saw a bigger gap between the 155h and also the 255h here but I think the reason for that, even though they're in the same box, is just because of this power limit difference. When the power is kind of a little bit more similar, frankly, Arrow Lake is just a more efficient system. With that, I think it's time to get to our key lessons learned. Okay, so with all of this, what do we learn? So let's talk about the pricing, because I think that's a big part of this. This thing retails for somewhere in that like 650 to 675 dollar range, which is, you know, it does include the CPU and the power supply and case and all that kind of stuff, but you still have to put memory and an SSD in it. And frankly, that just kind of makes it not the cheapest solution out there by far. Frankly, I think that one of the challenges is really that the Apple Mac mini is performance wise, not too far off from this. It's in that same ballpark. You get the base model for a lot less than this, but once you start adding things like memory, once you start adding things like storage, this has a much higher storage capacity point. You could put 96 gigabytes of memory in here. So you do have the ability to run, I guess a lot more in a system like this. You also may just wanna run a Linux desktop like Ubuntu, or you may wanna run Windows. And so in either case, I think that's a good reason to get a system like this. Also, you have things like vPro. So if you want to have remote manageability, you can get that where you don't really have that feature on the Apple side. But if you're trying to build like an absolutely like the least expensive PC that you can, then I think the Apple Mac Mini is pretty darn strong. The other big one is really Arrow Lake. Now, I know folks are gonna have seen a bunch of stuff on the gaming side and you know, people People had hit videos against Arrow Lake and that's fine. But on the other hand, I think for a mini PC, Arrow Lake is actually a pretty nice improvement over Meteor Lake. In fact, it's probably one of the best ones that we've seen in a long time. It almost makes me feel like, frankly, Intel said, yeah, we're gonna sell some of our chips for gaming, but really what we need to go prioritize on is things like mobile segments and also like, you know, mini PCs or whatever. And since this is an ASRock industrial product, I think the really important thing here is that 
you know, if you did have a Meteor Lake version, you can go get the Arrow Lake version and they're pretty much the same other than you just get the newer, faster, better CPU. And so that to some people is really important because they may design these into different applications and they need everything to stay the same over generations. And so I guess that's the benefit there. But of course, I do want to see better labels and more USB ports. But I also would love to hear what you guys think. And hey, if you did like this video, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.